This just happened a few hours ago. I have called and reported it to the police, and I'm home safely, but guess I am still in shock. Could do with putting it down in writing to process it and figure this is a good place as any to share what happened. I finished work early today and so decided to go out for a run. I set out around 4.30 and decided my usual routes which cross many roads will not be very practical and so I took an alternate route along a canal towpath and some pathways through woods that I knew would be less busy. Everything was going well. I was pushing myself steady until I got to a pathway on the back around 6 kilometers into the route. It is a long straight path with a canal on the left side and on their right there is a wasteland where some factories used to be but have mostly been demolished. It has been left abandoned for as long as I can remember and is overgrown with trees and weeds but there are the odd bits of an old factory that for some reason were fully demolished. As I got level with one part of the factory which still had some old metal fire escape steps attached to it, I noticed a rough looking guy sat on the wall with his legs hanging down. He jumped to his feet as he saw me coming and shouted something but I couldn't make it out. As I came level to where he was I heard him say, Wait there, can you help me find my phone? He said this while he was running down the steps and... So I stopped as I got level with where the bottom of the steps were, meaning we were standing just a few feet apart, but with a fence in between us. It was a really old iron fence with vertical metal bars that have spikes at the top like you sometimes see around churches and things. He asked me if I would help him find his phone again, saying he had dropped it somewhere nearby, and asked if I could ring his number so he could listen for it. I felt I couldn't exactly refuse as my phone was strapped to my arm, so I said he could tell me the number and I took my phone off my arm and unlocked it. He blurted out a phone number but said it far too fast and it didn't begin with 07 which made me start to feel like something wasn't right. I entered 7 numbers and then he started to look around and saying, I can hear it, come and help me look, as he looked around at the ground. I was about to say that I haven't even finished dialing when... A much larger guy appeared from behind a section of wall to my right. He was also really scruffy looking and from the look of his eyes, it seemed like he was on drugs. He came out saying that he could hear the phone ringing over towards him and beckoned me to come through a gap in the fence and help look. The first guy then said, It's ringing, yeah? And I told him it was, even though I still hadn't dialed the last digits, and now I was sure that they were trying to lure me to come over to that side of the fence. After two or three times of them both beckoning me to come and help, always insisting they could hear the ring, I heard the second guy say, Yo, he's not going to fall for it. He said it in a hushed way as if he thought that I wouldn't hear, but with it being out in the middle of nowhere I could clearly understand what he said. The first guy then started acting quite aggressive and punching a tree telling me he needed the phone badly and how his whole life was on the phone, telling me to come and help them look for it. While he was punching the tree and ranting, the second guy had taken a few steps away to the right, meaning I couldn't keep my eyes on both of them at the same time. It was after 5pm by this point and had gotten dark all of a sudden which made the whole thing even more unsettling. I noticed that there was a gap in the fence where some of the bars had been removed right where the guy was heading and I decided at that point to just get out of there and made a run for it. Neither of them said anything as I ran away, which makes me sure that they had malicious intentions. If they genuinely lost their phone and needed help, I would expect them to shout, where are you going, or something to try to get me to come back, but they didn't shout anything. After sprinting for a good 20 to 30 seconds, I turned to see if they were chasing me. They both were stood on the path around where the gap in the fence had been, but weren't chasing me. They were just standing there watching me run away. I continued running away, but kept looking back every few seconds until I was out of sight. It was at this point I got off the canal path and onto the roads. The person I spoke to on the phone to report it took my details and the descriptions but seems to think it wasn't anything worth worrying about, but said it will be investigated. The whole incident has left me a bit unnerved, and I am pretty sure I won't be jogging that route alone anytime soon.
So I was around seven at the time, and it was in summer of 2011. I live in a pretty small village in France where everyone knows each other and everyone trusts each other. My parents were working all the afternoon, and before going to work, they would drop me and my little sister at our grandparents' house, which was a 20-minute walk from where I lived, and our cousin would also join so we could play, watch movies, etc., it was summer vacation, and as usual with my cousin and my sister, which are both three years younger than me, we took our bikes and went out to ride around where my grandparents were living. There was a field very near to where we would always go, and a large place just in front of it that served as parking for those living nearby, so the place wasn't isolated. We had the order to get back at 8pm from my grandma, because that's the time where our parents will come fetch us. While we were at that place, I remember there was a woman playing with her son in front of her house with a water gun and a red car parked in front of her house. I know this car wasn't a car from someone around because I know that village very well, but I didn't think anything of it. There was a guy sitting in that car during the entire time we were here with our bikes, and that was the only thing I thought was weird. After we finished eating around 7pm, we begged our grandma to go out riding bikes again, and after lots of hugs and negotiations, she accepted, but told us to be careful because it was getting dark and to not follow or accept anything from a stranger. So we went out again, and we go back to where we had been all afternoon before, only my cousin, little sister, and myself. I'm going to be honest here, but for some reason I was so nervous that my stomach was hurting and I was almost crying. I didn't know why at the time and thought I was afraid of vomiting because my stomach was hurting, so that's why I was nervous. Because when I was that age, vomit was my absolute phobia. Now that I'm older, I can only think that what I was feeling was actually anxiety. While my sister and cousin were talking and riding together, I was just sitting on my bike trying not to cry and just watching them. We stood here a long time and, as usual, we didn't watch the hours go by. My grandma was used to us coming back late though, but we would get scolded every time. Then, the red car appeared again, except this time there was now three guys in it. They all had lots of muscles and seemed to be in their thirties. They stopped by my little sister and cousin and, being the older one, I quickly approached to see what they wanted. I was and still am a really, really shy person, so I didn't want to be the one to tell them to leave us alone because at that point... Something was just off and I wanted to leave. The red car stops and the guy that was sitting in the back comes out, smiling and appearing very innocent. He told us, Hey, I know where you live. We can give you a ride home. With the voice of an adult talking to a baby, first big red flag, I politely tell him that, no, we're fine and that we're about to go back to our grandparents' house anyway. He became angry Second big red flag. He told us that he knew our grandparents and that he was here to bring us back to them. At that point I was thinking, why would he bring us back in his car while their house is literally like five minutes away? I asked him how he could bring us if we had the bikes. And besides, there was only two seats free in the car. He became even more angry and told us to, Hey, just get in the car. She'll get on my knees showing my little sister that was very short. At that point, I don't really know. I'm both thinking that maybe it's true and he's getting impatient because we're already late and he maybe had something else to do after bringing us back. And at the same time, I just have the word run in my head. So luckily this ends well, because it turns out we were incredibly late and our grandma had sent my grandpa to go get us. When he arrived, he asked the guy what they were doing, and they just answered that they were checking how we were, and left. I told my grandpa what had happened, and I can promise you I've never seen him so enraged before. He called them all the insults in the world and called the police right when he got home. That's when seven-year-old me understood what had just happened, and I was terrified of going out for so long. Now it's okay, but... I'm still so anxious about being outside, even if I'm with somebody. Sadly, I don't know what happened next. I don't know if those guys were ever found. I don't know if they tried kidnapping other kids. I don't know anything. 
So for those three suspicious guys in the red car in France on a summer evening in July of 2011, never come back to our town again. So this story begins with my mom, my little brother, six years old at the time, and myself being 19. Our washing machine broke at our house and my mom refused to fix it because all of us were always running up the bill anyways when we used the machine constantly. So naturally we started going to the laundromat to wash all of our clothes. Now the laundromat that we've been using has been the same one we've used for nearly a decade. I have a big family consisting of eight people, all boys except for my mom, bless her soul. So we usually went to the laundromat for washing clothes even when the machine was working. Even when we move houses, we still use the same laundromat because of loyalty reasons. The owner knew us, watched us grow up, and were very friendly with us when changes were happening around the laundromat. Now I recently got some new earbuds that I was itching to test out for my phone, and the laundromat is the perfect place to be able to play some music quietly, wash, dry, and fold clothes without causing any issues. The routine started as normal, with my mom and I putting clothes in separate washers depending on their color, size, thickness, etc. My little brother, who was with us at the time, was just running around playing with all of the other kids that may have been there. We were there in the middle of the day when most people were at work, so it was nearly empty, save for a few independent moms and I think one kid. Putting the clothes into the machines, which were a few garbage bags full, only took us about 15 to 20 minutes. I remember seeing my little brother running up and down the aisles, having got this really bouncy ball from the 25 cent dispenser that the laundromat had. During this, both my mom and I noticed that a silver car had pulled up at the front of the laundromat and had been sitting there for a long duration whilst no one got out to prepare to wash clothes. Nothing super unusual, it was just odd. Even I've been known to sit in the car for half an hour dreading washing clothes. At that time, the clothes had been in the washers and started, so we just had to sit around and wait for the clothes to finish washing so we could put them into the dryers and head home after folding. So far, so good. I decided to put in my earbuds, listening to my favorite 200 plus song playlist that I still haven't sorted. But when I listen to the music, I tend to walk around and not pay attention to anything, either inside or outside. Though I stayed on the front sidewalk, right in front of the doors of the laundromat when I did go outside. I headed outside with my little brother, and my mom was still inside. I was pacing while slightly dancing to the music I was listening to, not really caring what others thought about me. I only stopped when I heard a car honk near my left, making me startle bad and stare at the car that scared me. It was a silver car that had been parked there earlier. Still, no one had gotten out of that car at this point. I looked over at the car, taking out one of my earbuds and trying to see who had honked their horn because it was near me. The driver's side tinted window rolled down on the car and an older man was sitting in the seat, looking directly at me. I instantly got a bad vibe from the guy because he looked like he was too happy to see me for a complete stranger. My mom at this point walked outside to our car, which was about two cars away from the silver one. She was getting something out, but noticed that I was being talked to by the stranger, and here's how the conversation went. The pastor. Excuse me, young man. I'm a pastor over at X and X Church. I'm looking for some new musicians for our band because our other ones left. Me hearing that he was a pastor immediately put down my guard as I had been to church before, and that position is always a respected one. Oh, well... I'm not a musician, but I do know of someone that you can contact. He seemed satisfied with that answer, but he motioned for me to come closer, and I took a step towards the edge of the sidewalk, still not stepping off because I still didn't want to get too close. Can you come closer? I can't quite hear you. Me, just speaking louder. I said I know of someone that you can contact. He's actually a pianist and a saxophone player. I actually did know one of my mom's best friend's fiancé who was super talented with music and acting. The pastor just motioned me over to him again. 
but this time his facial expression was less approachable but not quite menacing, almost annoyed that I hadn't walked up to him yet. By now, my mom had looked up from her car, having gotten whatever she was looking for and walked up the sidewalk talking to me. Uh, hey, who is that? What do they want? I don't know. They said that they're a pastor and that they're looking for musicians. Immediately, Mom's expression turned serious and annoyed, saying to back away from the car and tell him to go find some place else to look for that. I looked back at the pastor, who was then glaring daggers at my mom, like legit scowling at her as if something he had planned had been ruined. I backed away from the sidewalk, glad that I hadn't stepped into the parking lot yet, and just shrugged my shoulders apologetically towards the silver car before turning around and walking back inside the laundromat. My mom followed me inside and asked me more about it later. She said she had heard the car honk and that she saw the old guy talking to me, but the moment it looked as if though I was going to step into the parking lot, she intervened to stop me because the guy was super suspicious. I argued that I could take care of myself, being 19, but she didn't care. Also, we had my little brother still inside the laundromat, so it could have been a ploy to get me distracted in order to get to him, which was even scarier. The only doors to enter were the ones that were directly in front of the laundromat, but our washers and dryers were in the far back corner. We continued to talk about it, laughing later about how weird it was that a pastor would come to a laundromat to ask for musicians for his church. Why didn't he go to people in his church to ask for references? It only made it creepier that while we were folding up the clothes after we dried them, we had noticed that the car was gone, and the pastor never got out of his car to wash clothes after sitting in that parking lot for over an hour. Honestly, I don't think he would have been able to pull me through the car window or something because I'm a pretty big dude, but I figured that maybe they weren't after me, but after my little brother who was running around the laundromat the entire time. The place had an entire front wall of windows so you could clearly see into the place all the way into the back. I even looked up the church to see if the pastor was telling the truth but was shocked to find that the pastor's picture that was online was nowhere near the same as the one that approached us that day. It still gives me shivers. This is one of my favorite stories to tell. It describes my childhood and fits this community, so I decided to share. It was 2009, I'm in high school and I'm male. I live in an island where most people live near the coast, but my childhood house is deep in the mountains. Imagine a house in the woods but at the very top of a mountain. The house is surrounded by thick mists every night like in bad horror movies and the woods around it start less than two feet from the outer walls of the house. Our closest neighbor is a 15-minute drive, and five minutes away there's an abandoned house. I think the house belonged to a distant relative, but was abandoned more than 40 years ago. There's no street lights, and there's all kind of animals roaming the area. This is important to the story because even though you couldn't see a group of 10 people hiding one meter away from you in the woods, you could hear absolutely everything up to a kilometer away. If we saw car lights or heard a car approaching, me and my family would turn off the lights and hide. Don't know why. Shy, antisocial, you name it. I think that's enough to set up the story, but I'll add some details that might be important. My house is small and impoverished, but our family car was a good one. I don't know much about cars, but my dad always says that without a really good car, we wouldn't be able to go up and down the mountain we lived in. Also, there's currently eight people inside our house around 11 p.m. So I'm at the dining table enjoying some cereal while I watch some anime, having the time of my life. The lights in the house are on, so nothing could be seen in the dark outside. There's a window in front of me that looks to the front entrance of the house and the only road. Something catches my attention, but I don't hear or see anything. I think I see a human silhouette outside, but it doesn't move. So I just ignore it as some effect of the lights in the house and my own reflection. More anime, more cereal. I feel something moving at the other side of the window, and this time the silhouette is waving at me. I felt my heart jump out of my chest and froze. 
The person outside waves at me as if trying for somebody else in the house to notice him. After maybe ten seconds in which I'm just looking at him with a spoon halfway in my mouth, he decides to call, Hello, I need help. My parents hear him and approach the window, which made me sure I wasn't looking at a ghost. Amazing news to me. The man outside starts telling a story about how he got his car stolen at gunpoint and needs help. My parents are surprised that nobody heard his footsteps or a car or anything, so they whispered their theories amongst themselves. For the mysterious guy's story to be true, he had to be mugged more than a mile away, got his car stolen, and then walk for half an hour in the dark through the woods following the dim light of her house. My parents still decide to believe him and they offer calling the police. Our visitor begs to say the stupidest thing he could have. Uh, don't call the police. I don't have a gun. My parents stay silent for a while. The guy outside knows he's messed up but proceeds to make his request. Can I get a ride downtown? My dad nervously chuckles and gives him an excuse. He mentions the time, the fact that he felt that the guy was lying, and that he had already called the police, which was a lie. This isn't my favorite part of the story begins. I stand up from the table, shaking. I go to a closet, and even though I can't see the guy's face, I know he's still following my actions. I get two machetes that are half my size and run to the other room. I was terrified, and looking back, I probably took away the only weapons my parents could have used to protect themselves in case of an altercation. I open a door to the room where me and my siblings sleep, and they were watching some silly show, probably something stupid like Hannah Montana or iCarly, and their hyena laughter came out. My sisters are loud, and my younger brothers are four years old, seven years old, and nine years old, so their laughs are angelical by day and demonic by night. I signal at them to shut up and they do so, joining me and my parents in our fear. We hear in silence as the guy says, It's okay if you can't help me. I'll go to the next house. There's no next house. You should wait for the police here, my dad said. I don't need the police. I'm good. This goes back and forth. The guy is now in good shape to walk an hour down the mountain to reach downtown. My dad offers a rusty metal tricycle from our porch so that he can go downtown as a joke. The guy accepts this offer and grabs the tricycle. I assume he just wanted to leave with something. This tricycle is 20 years old and it definitely doesn't work. We hear it screeching for a couple of seconds as the stranger struggled to be able to ride it and then it stopped not too far away from our house. It seemed like he stopped and we didn't hear any footsteps that indicated the guy had left. After trying to identify if he was still on site to Noah Vast, my dad calls the police. We wait in silence, looking at the road from the front windows. Fifteen minutes later, the police get there. Amazing time back home. Heroic, even. And as soon as the red and blue lights show up, they illuminate the entire road up to the abandoned house. The tricycle is still in the road not too far away. The police claim not seeing anybody on the road. Only one road in the mountain. If the guy kept on walking, they would have seen him. So they just take a look at the woods with a flashlight and call it a day. The cops were clearly freaked out by the eerie look of our house and didn't stay for more than five minutes. Nothing else happened that night. I slept with two machetes under my pillow, which I remember angered one of my sisters. We have no idea who the person was. No carjackings were reported the next day. And even though a lot of weird things happened around my house, we never saw this guy again. It's pretty obvious he was trying to steal our family's car, but there were a few things we could never understand. Where did he come from? Where did he go? If his story was true, he had the worst luck in the world. I think the situation was interesting because I think about his point of view and our horror night turns a bit comical. I mean, imagine this. You go to rob a house... Turns out the people inside speak calmly. I don't know how much criminals encounter this as they try to intimidate or deceive. There's a scrawny, seemingly mute kid that tries to be sneaky and grabbing some machetes and then hiding the darkness in the house. And there's child's laughter coming from the non-visible rooms from the house. 
He could see the doors, but the inside of the rooms would be geometrically impossible to look into from the windows. I think we were lucky to out-creep the creep that night. I don't see any other reason for the guy to back out from his plans. The guy clearly had a gun and bad intentions, not to mention his ability to ninja walk through a forest where we even hear wildcats walking around. Also, no neighbors to witness or hear anything. When people say nothing good ever happens past midnight, they say it for a reason. I, along with my girlfriend at the time and my best friend, sneaked out during the summer. We did this quite often and each time was better than the last. I mean, the first time the three of us did set the bar really low and was easy to be beaten. It was about 1.30am and the three of us were downtown. We have weddings in our town and, as you know, these things go really late. We saw a couple stumbling on the street dressed for a wedding that was happening that night. We started cracking jokes to each other like the dumb teens we were, and then out of the blue, I see the man hit his wife. I'm not sure if they were boyfriend, girlfriend, or husband and wife, but for the sake of simplicity, I will go with the latter. I look over to my girlfriend and buddy and see the look of shock on their faces. The man started screaming at her, saw us, and took off. Instantly, and against my girlfriend's wish, I ran up to the wife that was crying, face down on the ground. My girlfriend and friend were at the end of the street. I told them to give us some space. I'm trained to deal with things like this, I'm in a Navy program and know how to talk to people. She was clearly very, very intoxicated and could hardly talk. I was able to calm her down and asked her what her name was, where she was from, where she's staying, etc., this conversation went on for about 15 minutes and by now, my group had caught up with me and, like I asked, was giving me space to do my thing. She told me where she was staying, but told me she didn't know how to get there and that she was from out of town. I told her not to worry and that everything would be okay. I helped her up and started to walk to where she was staying. It was about a fourth of a mile away and when someone has a very difficult time walking, it takes a long time just to go about 20 feet. Nonetheless, I knew this was the right thing to do and wanted to help. Coincidentally, the police station was right across the street and thank God for this. I usually check my back when we go out at night because there was some pretty weird people where I live and I was lucky that I was being that cautious. I turned around to see a man, tall in stature, incredibly muscular and angry behind us and my friends. I turned to the woman and asked if that was her husband, to which she started trembling and was able to mutter, yes. I told my friend to get away from us because I knew things were going to get bad. They went to the other side of the street and I could tell that they were scared for me. My buddy has his phone out, ready to call 911, and my girlfriend was shaking. Then this guy was on me and his wife. He was screaming at me for having the audacity to help her and for being near his wife. The entire time I was an occasionally glancing down at his hands when they weren't in my face to make sure they weren't in fists. I never said anything to try to start more of an argument, only things like, Sir, you need to step away from me. You need to calm down, the police station is just literally across the street. Things that you would say to avoid getting beaten up. I'm a tall guy, I'm 6'2 and feel like I'm not someone people want to mess with, but I'm under 18. This guy was probably early 30s, about 6'4", and honestly 100% muscle. Very, very scary man. I looked down, saw his hands in a fist, and stepped back quickly, keeping his wife behind me. This wasn't smart. Standing in between a drunken man and his wife is a big, big no-no. I mouthed to my friends to get the police right now, and he turned around and sped the other way. The man didn't notice me doing this, so I figured I was good. The police answered my buddy and he was pointing over to us, but they didn't come out. It took them about five minutes to come out and by then, thankfully, the guy fled. I told them what had happened and they sent out a search team for this guy. Turns out he was hiding on the road we were just on a little down the way. The police took the woman, escorted her back to where she was staying and kept the man in the station for the night. They thanked me for what I did and told my friends and me that we should go home. We agreed as youth does and went on our way. 
moral of this story is, if you see someone who needs help, help them. It's up to you. Be the hero they need. So some backstory info before I begin. This is something that I found out about a week ago, but has been ongoing apparently for several years. I'm 24 female and my partner is 24 male. His ex-girlfriend before he met me, another key member of this story, is also a 24-year-old female, and her ex-boyfriend, the one directly before she dated my boyfriend, is 35-year-old male. To start, I began frequently attending a goth club and their events that happen once a week. My two best friends are there regularly, so I decided I would work on not being a depressed hermit that never leaves my house and start socializing and making more than my two only friends. So I started going with the intention of making new friends, and I did. It was all going really well, and I'm usually very shy and anxious, but I started feeling safe enough there that I was able to open up to people approaching me and befriend them. One night I keep noticing a goth boy in makeup and platform boots because, one, he has a cool cape and, two, he seems to always be somewhere nearby. It's a large club with several rooms inside and outside, but I didn't think anything odd of it immediately. He eventually approaches me to say hello and I ask if I know him, since I've noticed him nearby frequently throughout the night, and he says, Yeah, you're Nero's girlfriend, right? I replied, yeah, so you're a friend of Nero then? He laughs and says, Well, kind of. We actually just have a mutual ex-girlfriend. All of my boyfriend's exes are pretty terrible aside from one from the stories I've heard from him, his parents, and his friends. So I had no interest in hearing more after that. I told him it was nice meeting him and ran off to rejoin my friends. The very next week... He's there again and says hello when he sees me. I realized before that I hadn't asked his name, so after he greeted me I said, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your last name. He says, Oh, I'm sorry, I was so drunk. I'm embarrassed for even bringing up Marie like that, but my name is Gerald. I tensed up hearing Marie's name because she was the girl Nero dated before me, and she was still openly admitted to having feelings for Nero, and had tried to make advances several times from the moment we started dating. Thankfully, they were all shut down. I trust my boyfriend, but I have a very strong dislike for Marie. I said, Oh, so your mutual ex is my favorite one. Sarcastically. He nodded. Yeah, be careful with Marie, she's a dangerous one. He talked a bit more about his previous relationship with Marie, mostly about how manipulative she was, how much she cheated on him, just generally badmouthing her. He kept stuttering, seeming a bit awkward and shy, so I wrote him off as being harmless, and we finished our conversation and didn't speak again for the rest of the night. Over the next couple of months, I'm there every week as usual, but suddenly, so is Gerald. He hadn't been someone that regularly attended before, but I really wasn't feeling paranoid about it yet because, one, he seemed so awkward, shy, and innocent when I talked to him. Two, it is like the only goth club around. Maybe he just discovered he liked the place and was also just trying to make new friends. So I told myself that it would be irrational to think he was there for me. I have PTSD and anxiety disorder, so it's not uncommon that I have irrational, intrusive, sometimes paranoid thoughts. So I choose to ignore him. One afternoon, Marie calls Nero as he and I were laying down and watching a movie. She wanted to catch up and see how he's doing. They had been friends for years before they dated and while I don't particularly like her, I trust him and I would never try to dictate who he can and can't be friends with. He has a pretty short casual conversation, asks if she needs anything and then hangs up the phone. I told him, Oh, that reminds me. I forgot to tell you I met one of Marie's exes a little while ago. He laughs and asks which one. I said, his name was Gerald. And my boyfriend's smile immediately fell from his face and his eyes went huge. All the color drained from his face. Did you say you met Gerald? Where did you meet him? What did he say? 
Feeling panicked by his reaction, I'm stuttering. Uh, N Nora and I were at Goth Club one night and he asked if I was your girlfriend. My boyfriend starts freaking out. I should mention, he has several severe mental disorders and one of them being a panic disorder, so as he's on the verge of having a panic attack and I'm trying to calm him down in all of my confusion. When I finally get him calmed down enough, he starts to explain. Before him and Marie dated five years ago, she had broken up with Gerald for having abusive and obsessive behavior. Afterwards, Gerald began stalking Marie. He would wait outside of her house, wait for her to leave, and follow her everywhere she went, never confronting her, just watching and writing it all down in a journal. Writing down what she was doing, how it made him feel, writing down all the little things she did throughout the day. In this journal, he also wrote about how he was sorry for cheating on her, telling her about the two girls he cheated on her with, a 16-year-old and a 17-year-old, and he was 30 years old at that time. It was already odd, in my opinion, that he was a 30-year-old dating the 19-year-old Marie, but he also cheated on her with underage girls, and he openly admitted it in this journal. And when Marie started dating Nero, he began following Nero as well. Another important thing to know about my boyfriend is that he has schizophrenia. Nothing could possibly be worse to a paranoid schizophrenic trying to create stability in his life than an actual stalker following him around and making him feel that much more paranoid. Gerald followed them around, writing about both of them in the journal. He printed screenshots from their social media accounts and pictures of them he'd taken, pasting them into this horrifying journal. And then Gerald waited for Marie and Nero to be at her house, and then he left this journal full of horrors at her doorstep. Obviously, both of them panicked when they read the contents. Nero begged Marie to go to the police, but she didn't want to. Something about her child and being scared of it making her look like an unfit mother. I don't know. Nero broke things off with Marie due to incompatibility, and a year later we met and ended up dating pretty quickly. But unbeknownst to him... Gerald had never stopped stalking Nero. We discovered he would make fake accounts just to try to check in and see what Nero was doing, since he'd blocked all of Gerald's accounts that he knew of. We found that Gerald had added Nora, mine and Nero's close mutual friend, and of course on her Facebook there were lots of pictures of the three of us together, which is how Gerald found me. And I typically accept friend requests with a decent number of mutual friends, so Gerald had added me from there before we'd met in person, realizing that I was Nero's current partner. I'm pretty open about a lot of things, which I'm now realizing can be a negative thing with most of my posts set to public. I'm always posting pictures of Nora and myself at his goth club, every week, so he knew that he could run into me there, and I'm sure hoping that Nero or Marie would be there as well. But since learning about all of this, I started looking back through photographs from the weekly events, and I'm finding him somewhere in the background near me numerous times without me knowing. He played the shy, awkward card, and I really fell for it. I was stupid and fell for it. Yesterday, talking to other friends about my discoveries, showing them who he is, even multiples of them have said, Oh yeah, I thought you were friends with him because I always saw him following you and Nora around. I felt so nauseous I wanted to vomit. I somehow was so oblivious. I didn't even realize that my boyfriend's ex's ex had been stalking me. Following me through the club, appearing in every room I'm in when I'm in it. Nero showed me pictures of the journal entries and it was horrifyingly scary. My stomach dropped and I felt sick. How could I have been so obliviously naive? My safe space no longer feels like it's safe anymore. He just spreads his obsession, continually growing and latching on to others involved, while he's still following Marie. Even after all these years, she is afraid when she leaves her house, and now I'm afraid to leave mine. I'm afraid to go back to this club and see him again. I'm afraid for my friends that attend. How much more will his obsession grow? Who else is he going to follow? Has he followed me home? Does he know where I live now too? I've been feeling so paranoid and unsafe, I haven't left my boyfriend's house since I found out. I'm afraid to be home and alone. I obviously won't be going back to that club for a while. 
I asked Marie to take the journal to the police and get a restraining order. I want one myself, but I'm not sure that I have enough evidence to support needing one, but she definitely does having that journal. I hope one day I won't have to look over my shoulder any time I leave my house. To preface this, I would like to say that I have never had any issues with Uber before or after this incident. This was simply an isolated incident that was weird and a little scary. I live in a college town and when I was going to the university I used to take Ubers everywhere that I couldn't walk to. The parking security at my college were ruthless and I didn't need a ton of parking tickets tacked onto my mounting debt. Not very cost effective, but a surefire way that I'd get where I needed to be without losing my parking spot or getting accosted. The night of this particular incident, I had been at a friend's house about five miles from my dorm. I called an Uber as usual, and I was picked up by a guy in his mid 20s. Followed standard safety procedures, asking his name, checking the license plate, asking what my name was, all clear. Guy is definitely an Uber driver, he even has the little light on top of the car. I get in and immediately this guy begins conversation. I don't mind talking to my Uber drivers, I figured it's just polite, but this guy starts our drive by asking question after question. There was the standard, where are you from, and are you in college, super normal right? Then, how much do you weigh? This threw me off more than a lot. Seeing as that definitely isn't a normal thing to ask a stranger, but the guy had a thick accent and seemed unfamiliar with the area. He was ignoring maps, taking weird turns here and there, but was ultimately headed in the direction of my dorm. I answered his question, following up with a sort of nervous chuckle and telling him that wasn't really a question he should be asking a lot of people. Just a joke, but still. But you're beautiful. Probably just the ideal weight for me. All right, red alarm bells, grade A, inappropro. I should have said something snippy back, but all I could do was just sort of laugh. I respond with, eh, ideal weights fluctuate. Stupid, right? But I froze up. Maybe it was just his culture or something. I turned the question on him to sidetrack him from that weird comment, and it turns out the guy's from the Ukraine. He doesn't need an invitation to start talking about himself, and I lapse into the standard uh-huhs and wows to keep him on track. Honestly, this trick works really well when you straight up can't avoid someone who might be flirting with you. They get so caught up in themselves that they forget you're listening. However, this guy seemed to take me asking vague questions as me taking interest in him. He starts staring at me through his rearview mirror, catching my eyes for uncomfortable amounts of time. He's still driving, but I notice that we're starting to take a super roundabout way to my dorm. Of course I'm nervous now. The roads are deserted. It's incredibly late and I'm alone. But I try and brush it off as a cultural thing again. Maybe I got too chatty. Maybe it's my outfit, etc. I pick up my phone and pretend to text, and this guy takes the cue to pry further. Do you have a boyfriend? Yep, we've been together a year. Wow. Ever want to try the market out? You're so young. Nah, we're really happy. It's a shame. Really a shame. He's still trying to maintain eye contact, leaning towards the back seat. I hum or something in response, and to my joy, I see we're finally approaching my dorm. The guy super slowly creeps to a stop at the curb, and I belt out the standard thanks for the ride, I'll rate you five stars, and go for the door handle. This guy hits the lock button, and I'm locked in. I whip my head around at him, and he's turned all the way around in his seat, seatbelt off, and grinning like he just won the lottery. I'm freaked out. Um, your doors are still locked. He ignores me, still grinning and asks bluntly for my phone number. I decline as politely as possible, even though I feel like knocking his lights out no sale. He asks again, this time more forcefully, and adding, I would really love to get to know you better. I can meet you right here tomorrow if you want. 
Once again, I decline, reminding him that I have a boyfriend and he most definitely would not like that. So you're not allowed to have friends? We can just be friends. Lots of girls around here have friends. At this point, I'm in full panic mode. What he said sounded innocent enough, but he was borderline cornering me into his back seat and was boring holes into me with his eyes. I was afraid he'd drive off with me if I said no again, and I had no means of fighting on me. I'm tall, 5'11", but my limbs are like noodles. This dude had biceps like basketballs. There was no way I'd be able to fight him off. He asked for my phone number again. I don't decline, but blurt out, Unlock your door! He starts to protest, but I repeat myself, pulling the door handle a couple of times. I raise my eyebrows at him, try to give him my best entitled face. I said, unlock it! Finally, looking crestfallen, he turns back around and slowly puts his seatbelt on and unlocks the door. I bolt out of the car, slamming the door and breaking into a sprint until I'm finally locked into my dorm room. I'm freaked out for another hour or two, but I'm able to go to sleep. I woke up the next morning to a text from this guy, who told me I was the most beautiful woman he had ever met and how he wished I hadn't left the car. Immediately, I block him and report him to Uber. I haven't heard anything from the guy since. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. Then join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly, and if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, send all your cowboys to Ram Ranch. <laughs>